Welcome to the Exodus Cry podcast, where we have honest conversations around exploitation, trafficking, sexual culture, and justice. Tom, welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy to sit down with you and talk about the work of the Epic Project. You've been leading the Epic Project since around, I want to say 2010. Is that right? Or... Uh, 2011. Okay, 2011. Yeah, okay. 11, 12. Yeah. Okay. A bunch of years. In, yeah. In this work, it's like dog years, right? Been doing it for a hundred years, it feels like. Yeah. We released a film this past year. Well, actually, we haven't had a wide release, but we've been, we've been doing screenings of a film called Buying Her, which is about the demand side of trafficking. And something I've always appreciated about your work with the Epic Project is the specific focus on work with men. Um, it seems like nearly every conversation that I have about this issue of human trafficking eventually steers to the subject of demand, which I'm grateful for, because that's that's really where this conversation should steer towards. Um, but I don't think there's anyone better to talk on this subject than you, given your experience working in this space. What stirred you to want to start an outreach to men? When I first started learning about this issue, and I actually predates the start of Epic, um, had worked with, um, as a volunteer with Shared Hope International, even before Epic, um, what I saw was a supply and demand business system. Um, that's what trafficking is, um, essentially. and. I saw, I recognized a couple things. First of all, I'm not a, um, you know, I wasn't a cop or a, a therapist that was qualified to give, you know, any, provide any kind of services. Um, and, and I certainly wasn't a celebrity, so I was, I was stuck. I didn't know what to do as far as what kind of contribution could I make. Um, but I, because I recognized it was supply and demand, I also realized that men were the, the drivers of it. Men create the, I think what I said early on was men create the demand um, that drives sex trafficking and the problem's not going to go away until um, enough men show up to change that equation. Um, so to me, it was, um, it was clear. I just, I don't, and I'm not a business guy, but I, I looked at it kind of through a business lens lens early on. Um, and I just saw the supply and demand and, and, so I knew that men were the drivers. I'm a guy. I knew I could talk to guys. And so it wasn't any more um, dramatic than that, really. Was there a particular story or moment that kind of arrested you and grabbed your attention to kind of redirect you into this? Yeah, yeah. There was, uh, I'd begun, and I wasn't doing any work in this space, but I had, I had heard a story about a kid locally who had been groomed and, and targeted by um some guys it was a network of, of traffickers um and this was a kid that could have been one of my daughter's friends um she was a local high school kid played volleyball all my kids all my daughters played volleyball um and i and i realized that this was happening here prior to that point and it's funny i've had this conversation with probably hundreds of men over the years it's kind of the same story we always knew that that sex trafficking was something that happens in faraway places, but I didn't realize it was happening here. And so that really grabbed my heart um, because this was like my own, this was happening right at, under my nose. And I couldn't, I couldn't not do something. I had no idea what to do, but I couldn't just, you know, it's like once you know, you can't unknow it. Um, and so that led to literally years of learning and trial and error, uh, you know, trying to figure out different things that might be helpful. So it was, it was a story of a local kid in my own community. And, and I had, prior to all of this, I'd spent 30 years as a pastor, a youth pastor, church planter. Uh, I, I, I had a training gym and I worked with competitive athletes, um, mostly young women. So like I had spent a lot of time around young kids and to realize that this was happening in my own community, um, I just, you, you can't walk away from that. So that was, that was the impetus that got me into it, was that particular story. 
what's interesting about this space is that you know the idea of trafficking the widespread awareness about trafficking is still relatively new in terms of just people realizing that this is going on yeah and so it's interesting that so many of us in this movement have similar stories about we were doing one thing discovered this issue and then came into it going you know what can i do to help make a difference so it's it's a very interesting phenomenon that we see happening where there aren't a lot of people who are like specifically trained to fight trafficking a lot of this just came into the a lot of us just came into this recognizing and acknowledging this problem and it's so deeply disturbing the the reality of the injustice that is being invoked in so many people's lives that um people so many people are experiencing that does have that arresting effect to it yeah. like um like i can't go on with business as usual knowing that this thing is going on and yet i also don't know what to do about it so what i love about your story is coming into this space going i don't know what to do about this but i know i'm going to do something yeah and at the time that i first learned of you and and what the epic project was focusing on i was hearing a lot of stories about people who were thinking about or interested in you know doing some kind of work getting involved in the fight against trafficking and i would say you know 98% of those people i don't know if they're doing anything today so you're you're one of the few who i personally had the opportunity to see really come up with a solid plan and follow that through over years and now you guys are constantly in the conversation about the effort to stop trafficking um can you elaborate on the work that you guys are doing to address this yeah i appreciate that I, and i, I want to be clear when we started like <laughs> i was clueless and and the ideas i had were i, I look back on it now um you know kind of comical the stuff that i that i thought would work and fortunately i had the kind of the good grace to be surrounded by uh some people with significant amounts of wisdom that were able to kind of we were talking about jujitsu earlier they were able to kind of take my energy and redirect it um and so um what what i did early on mostly um was uh listen i spent a lot of time and it was frustrating but i spent a lot of time in meetings local task forces um, in the Portland, Oregon area where we started, uh, was involved with a kind of a stakeholder community of people with, you know, law enforcement, mental health, service providers, nonprofits, churches. And so I got invited to that table, but really I spent probably three years just listening because I didn't know, you know, I didn't know really the, um, the nuances of the issue. That... Um, that was time well spent, even though at the time it didn't feel like it, you know, because I'm I'm an activist and I want to, you know, I want to go out and find the bad guy, right? Right. And uh, and go all uh, Liam Neeson, yeah, you know, on on the bad guy. But um, I sat still, I listened, I made connections with some really wise, discerning people, and what um, what came out of that at the end of that three years was a conversation with a. a, a deputy district attorney and a member of the sex trafficking unit for the Portland Police Bureau. And I said, if I could bring you maybe a dozen guys, you know, trusted volunteers, could we sit down and talk about ways that we might be able to help with this situation? So, so that led to a dialogue, which led to a meeting where we sat down, the, the deputy DA, I'll never forget, she was, you know, she's probably five foot two and she walked into the room. There was a dozen of us and she um, lifted a stack of papers high over her head and it just and she had taped the pages end to end. And so this this, you know, this thing kind of cascaded down and it was um, 
single spaced, uh, maybe 10 or 12 point font, um, back page ads selling sex in Portland for the last three days. And it was like eight feet long. And she goes, this is what we're dealing with. And so she said, if you could figure out a way to go into that um, marketplace, so to speak, and, and learn what you can about who these buyers are, um, figure out ways to be disruptive, that might that would be really useful. The last thing we wanted to do was be, you know, vigilantes that would have caused more problems for law enforcement. But she was wise enough to say, here's, we could use some help on this anyway. And so um, we said, we'll, we'll take that challenge. We, um, and so what we did, it's actually uh, 10 years ago next month, beginning of October, we, um, uh, got it. We met in a church office on a rainy like Tuesday night with a burner phone that we bought at uh, Best Buy and a donated laptop, and we began posting fake ads on Backpage, which was the 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 Walmart of commercial sex at the time. Started posting fake ads selling sex and intercepting buyers and talking to buyers. And we had no clue. We just seemed like, hey, let's try this. And what what happened was we. Um, we were immediately inundated with just a sheer volume of calls. I remember my, the first ad I posted, you know, and it works just like um, Craigslist, right? You put the ad together, you hit submit, and I did that at 7 o'clock, and at about 7.04, the phone started ringing, and it rang, rang every other minute for an hour and a half. And this was just one ad. Um, and we, re we, just, we realized early on that we were – terribly ill-equipped to actually engage these buyers and we had a script we had talked with survivors we knew we knew what we wanted to say we should know how to how to actually begin that conversation so that was a very first iteration of the program we've been doing now for 10 years what that has led to um it's led to a ton of other opportunities and we can talk about that later but um what it's translated into for us in terms of our program is we have um, we've trained about 500 men across 20 cities now in the last 10 years, and that system has evolved into basically a national call center where we're regularly, I think the last count is 21 nights a month, we're online talking, actively talking to sex buyers at the point of sale. So in that, in that moment when they're trying to purchase another human being, we figured out ways to intercept that attempt and talk directly to buyers um, so that's the that's what we're known for that's the thing we've um, we've done the most for the last 10 years and it's um, it's a profound experience to be able to do that and to talk with other men in that moment ironically it's a moment of of extreme vulnerability for those guys which I you know I thought when we finally got to talk to him we were gonna you know we're gonna we're going to bring the hammer down and, you know, and shame them, you know, beat them up, that sort of a thing. But we've we've realized, I realized, our guys have realized that um, we're actually uh, the same culture that made those sex buyers to one degree or another made us too. And so there's actually a point of connection with those guys. And, and we're doing something different than law enforcement, obviously. We're not there to arrest them. So the conversation is very different. So... We, um, we have been in the sex buyer ecosystem uh, for 10 years, and we've seen a lot of, uh, we've just seen a lot. In 20 cities across the U.S.? Yeah, yeah. Are you guys doing anything internationally, or is it just you domestic? Right um, if Edmonton, Alberta counts. Alberta, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, we have done, so we've had, we have had some teams in Canada, um, but it, we haven't, uh, you know, America's um, one of the, if not the most um, prolific destination for sex tourism. So um, there's still a lot of work to be done here. So. so an ad is placed. There's a buyer on the other side of that ad. He believes he's responding to an ad to find a woman or a child that he can pay to have sex with. The phone call is made. It does he hear a 
female pick up the line or how, where does it go from no. the point of contact? Uh, our volunteers will, will pick up the call. Um, and, and a lot of times it starts as text message too. So you can't really tell via text, but what, what our, what our guys do is they identify themselves. Hey, I'm, I'm just, a, I'm just a guy that, uh, wants to talk to you about the reality of what this is and it might not be what you think it is. Um, and surprisingly, a lot of guys will, you know, it's a little bit of a deer in the headlights sort of moment, but a lot of guys will, will stop and they'll actually want to engage a lot. Don't as well. You know, what would you say the percentages of guys who actually stay on the line? Oh, you know, I, I don't think I could give an exact number. What I can say is, as our volunteers have gotten more skilled and more adept at, at really navigating that conversation with men, the, the number of guys that actually stay out has gone up and the length of the exchanges has, has increased, not just the, the phone calls, but even like sometimes text threads could go on for multiple days. Um, so it's just, you know, and, and our, our, um, Whereas when we began, it was a little bit of a gotcha sort of a moment. Mm -hmm. um, what we've kind of what we've evolved to now is just recognizing that there's a story that explains why a sex buyer thinks he can do that. And so our guys are uh, in a very authentic way are beginning the conversation by saying things like, hey, man, what's your story? How, how did you get here? And And again, some guys will just hang up. Some guys will threaten or want to debate or whatever. Um, but a surprising number of guys are, um, you talk about arrested, like it, it actually stops them dead in their tracks when they have an opportunity to talk authentically with another man who sees them as a human being. Um, and that's something that um, I think is uniquely our job to do as men in this, in this equation, you know? How might... A conversation like that go down he calls where does how do where, how do you yeah. how do you initiate the conversation and then you go from what is that what does that look like our a volunteer will um will answer the call um if, if it's a phone call and, instead of a text and the, say hey are you looking for uh michelle whatever you know and we know because of the system that we've developed we know the the name of, I call it the real fake person, the, you know, the persona that we've created for the ad. Are you calling for Michelle? And when you mention the name, that's enough of a hook to get them to go, oh yeah, that's, that's the gal I was calling for. And then it's just real simple. It's like, she's not here, but I wondered if I could talk with you. And so it's a real quick pivot um, to just, you know, obviously I'm not, I'm not Michelle. You can tell in my voice. And uh, so it's, it's just a real, in, in the, um, yeah, and the best the best scenario is, is that it's just I'm not Michelle. I'm just a guy. Can I talk to you about the reality of this? You know what's going on here, and then and then it it the initially the um, it was a highly scripted kind of a thing, um, and what we've learned over over ten years is. Um, we no longer have to give guys a map to navigate the conversation and get them where we want to go what we've started to do with our guys and training our guys is say, here's the destination. You figure out how to get them there. And, um, and it's, it's, like I said, it's, it's a profound experience when you do it. It's also amazing when you watch, uh, one of our, you know, one of our volunteers, um, engage guys like this and it can, um, it could go on for an hour the conversation. Um, so yeah. And so the idea, is ultimately to get them talking about what's going on yeah. with them. Like, and hopefully to share some things with them that will steer them away from this. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's some, there's, there's some myth busting that, that can go on in the conversation and, and we're, and our guys are trained at, at speaking to that because usually uh, if a guy, you know, really protests that he's not doing anything wrong, it's, you know, we're able to, um, our guys are, are really skilled enough to go, yeah, I know you think it's that, but have you considered this? So there's a little bit of myth busting, but the thing that is um, increasingly becoming obvious to us as we talk with guys is um, these men are, are lonely, uh, they're isolated, um, and there's a, 
you know, I think in a lot of ways, there's a lot of shame that already exists in their world, even before we encounter them. So, so like I said earlier, it, it, these guys are in a really vulnerable space. And what we're learning is that um, we have an opportunity, even in that short conversation, to create an experience of just kind of authentic connection and belonging with these guys, which we believe is one of the fundamental drivers um, that, that moves men to want to buy sex is they, they want to feel connected. And, but the culture has taught them that the only way you do that is through, you know, through sexual conquest or right. these sexual encounters. And by just having an authentic conversation with these guys, we're offering them something that certainly they didn't expect when they dialed the number. Um, but it's, uh, find that a lot of guys are kind of stopped in their tracks and, and actually receive that really well. Some don't, but yeah. So there's that initial averting of whatever scenario they thought they were getting into. Are you also seeing longer term rehabilitation of men? Are you seeing longer term, like where the, maybe you have this flashpoint with them over a call, but then where there's some kind of follow up with them, where they are clearly being reformed in their mindsets and behaviors or where, where does that go? That's a, yeah, that's a question we get asked a lot. The, um, the frustrating but truthful answer to that is we don't know yet um, because they hang up and we don't know if we'll ever talk to them again. We do, if, if, they're, if they are receptive um, and it, the, the system has been developed in such a way that we can follow up with them by sending them links to different, you know, like local resources, um, but we don't, um, we don't track that. We don't really don't have a way to track that at this point. Um, so it's, that's honestly, that's kind of the limitation of the, of the intervention at this point is we don't really have a way to, to track that. Um, I think what we're finding though, is that the, the impact of those conversations, it's significant on the, um, the buyers themselves, but it's, I think, um, the longer we do it, the more we realize it has a profound impact on the, the volunteers. And they see that the, and this has certainly been my story, but I think it's been mirrored with our guys. They see, like I was saying earlier, that the bad guy isn't, you know, some other guy. It's, it's us collectively as men in this culture. And so there's a um, super high degree of empathy that gets communicated um, with these guys. And, and, and again, I think that's why we're as men uniquely situated to connect with these guys. Cops don't have time, nor is it their job necessarily to be overly empathetic with a sex buyer. Right. Um, and, and that's a burden I would never want to place on, you know, victim advocates. Like that's not their job to, uh, communicate that empathy, but we can do that. Right. Cause we understand where they come from. We don't, we don't excuse it. You know, there's, there's always accountability, but, um, when a man can say to another man, and I've heard our guys do this, man, I, I get it. I was there. I've been where you are, you know, like that, that's a powerful thing that we are, um, like I said, uniquely positioned to offer to these men. Do you think the lack of a follow up from there mostly has to do with them wanting to protect their anonymity? In other words, you know who I, what I'm doing here. Yeah. So I'm not gonna, I don't want to fall like kind of trying to hide, I guess, cover their tracks or I get, because my, where my natural mind goes is there's this initial intervention and then Hey, why don't you come join this class yeah. or, you know, that is, that is the direction we're going where, where we will, um, we'll kind of turn it from a, um, the way I would describe it more from a passive intervention where they, you know, we intercept them, um, to an active intervention where the ones that we know are most, um, open to our message will, will receive, um, uh, a follow-up or, or an outreach. We generically, we call it, you know, a buyer outreach. So we're, we're gearing up to, to move in that direction. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, guys can, yeah, they can hide, they can say what they want uh, to kind of get off the hook and get out from under the, you know, the weight of, of that, that conversation. But I think the guys that actually stay on and have the conversation, um, a lot of them aren't looking to get out from underneath it. I think they feel connected and, and want to change. And the, the research that we've seen, the most recent and most comprehensive research um, show that a large number of these guys, um, the guys that actually stop buying sex do so because they finally realize it's inconsistent with what they really believe to be true. Um, and so I think, I think what we're in a position to do is, is help move them in that direction. So they, they, they can hang up on the, on, on the call and go and call another ad and set up a date and buy sex that night. And, and probably many of them have, but we've planted a seed, you know, in their, in their mind and heart. And I, and I think that seed can bear fruit eventually. In just a few decades, porn has invaded the screens of nearly every household with an internet connection. But few people know the truth about the multi-billion dollar industry behind this content. Action! Our documentary miniseries Beyond Fantasy rips the mask off of the porn industry. It takes viewers straight into the belly of the beast and brings them face to face with some of the biggest porn producers and performers as they describe, in their own words, an industry that profits from ethical violation, coercion and abuse. The chances, the risks that they take are the deal that they make with the devil when they come into this business. It's a hard-hitting series that exposes the porn industry like no other film, but keep in mind that it does include the use of blurred porn video clips, so we encourage viewer discretion. You can watch the Beyond Fantasy series for free on YouTube or at beyondfantasy.com. What have you learned in 10 years of doing this? What have you learned about the men who are seeking out paid sex, seeking out, paying to rent another person to have sex with? Uh, the first thing I think, like I've, like I've mentioned, is they're that same culture that, that nurtured and, and grew that sex buyer, same one that you and I grew up in. Uh, so we, we come from a, a culture that has normalized, um, you know, all forms of male domination and control and power and violence and aggression and all of those things. And um, so many things about how men look at the world are normalized. Mm -hmm. And the objectification of women is like, like, feels like it's at the top of that list of things that get normalized. So, um, so they grow up in this culture and it's, it's uh, in the, you know, in the typical kind of masculine culture, it's, it's an echo chamber. And it, it feels like for, I think for a lot of these guys, everywhere they look and every guy they turn to is reinforcing that sense of prerogative that, you know, that we as men have uh, to rent another woman's body for sex. And so I think they've, um, yeah, I, I think we've all, they've all grown up in that. A, a small percentage of them, of them will ever actually act out on it, mm -hmm. but we're all kind of part of that, that culture of objectification and, and normalization and, and, you know, just the sexually saturated um, world that we live in. So I think that's one of the things we've learned um, about buyers. I think um, what that's led to for me is realizing that there are, um, this isn't about buyers per se, but about men in general, um, we're all complicit to the degree that we don't do something, we're all complicit in this exploitative culture. Unless we're actually taking steps to counteract it, we're all part of that problem. That was, and that was the hardest thing for me to, to hear. Um, and, I, and I learned it a few years in, because I thought, you know, I'm showing up, I'm a guy, I'm here to, you know, a little right. bit of a, here I am to save the day right, sort of right. thing. And, and when I heard, survivors and advocates they would hear me talk about why i'm doing this work and it was it was all about you know rescuing women and that sort of a thing and and um 
it was just a, a play on the power and privilege that I had. And, and when I heard the very women that I was supposedly there to help call me out on that, it was it was an incredibly humbling experience. So I've, I've learned a lot about myself as well and just about masculine culture that way. Um, that if you're, I think by direct action or indifference, I think every man is complicit in this culture that creates sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. How many of the men would you say, uh, the men who are obviously, you know, involved in, in seeking out these illicit um, opportunities are married men versus, or men in relationships versus like single in terms of the demographic? Is it, is this, a lot of single men that are resorting to prostitution as an easier way to access sex? Or is this something that married men are involved in as well? Yes. <laughs> Both, okay. <laughs> it's it's uh, the way I've described it, and this is, um, I mean no disrespect to Applebee's, but go to Applebee's on a Tuesday night and look around. It's the men you see there. It's a cross section of of our culture. So yeah, a lot of them um, are white, middle class, married with children, you know, upper income. Uh, mm -hmm. But a lot of them are single day laborers and tradesmen. It's it's a cross section of men in just about any community. And and I I know this from the guys we've um, directly engaged with through our program, but we've also been a part of the, um, they're, they're generically called John schools, but a court mandated diversion program for guys that are arrested. And so I've spoken personally in, in person to, you know, hundreds of, of sex buyers and it's, it is a cross section. They're, they're, um, they're cops, they're pastors, they're teachers, uh, they're tradesmen, they're software engineers, doctors, um, retired farmers. Like that list, those are all guys that we've directly engaged with in the last 10 years. So it's very much a cross section. For the ones that open up about their, like, um, what's brought them to that moment, um, can you talk more about what you're hearing in, like, in the sharing of their own stories? Yeah, the, the best example of that was, um, one of our volunteers uh, who is just a, a sage of a guy, just tremendous wisdom. He started engaging with a buyer on the, uh, uh, via text message one night. We call the, the, the gathering for this intervention, we call it a patrol. So it's a two to four hour time slot. And so he had a, a buyer responding to an ad and this guy was just furious. And when, when, when Matt revealed himself and say, hey, I'm, I'm just a guy. I just wondered if I could talk to you. And this guy um, was livid and threatening and um, talked about how he had just returned from Afghanistan. He fought for his country and how dare you get in, you know, how dare you interfere with the freedom that I fought for, you know, that, that kind of language. And he goes, and the buyer said uh, via text, if you're a man, you'll give me a call. And so Matt called. And the guy picked up the phone and, and this was not scripted, but straight from the heart matches goes, sir, first of all, before I say anything else, I want to thank you for your service to our country. If it's okay with you, could I talk to you for just a moment about what freedom means for the girls that are in these ads? And he completely turned the, the, the entire conversation that then went on. I don't know if it was maybe 20 or 30 minutes, but the two of them talking man to man with mutual respect. And at the end of the conversation, the buyer thanked Matt for his respect and for um, an honest conversation and, and basically said, you've given me a lot to think about. And, and, you know, so that's, that's the kind of um, receptivity that we've seen with a lot of guys. Uh, in, in these moments. And um, like I said, though, not all of them go that way. Some of them are a little more, a little more hostile, but. So, so something that I feel like is, is on my mind to say is just, I would like to see 
more men have a vision for integrity. And I don't think you can be, I don't think you can harmonize renting another person for sex with being a person of integrity. Yeah. And I think that's kind of the lie that's sold to us with the normalization of the sex industry is you can still be a family man. You can still be a man of integrity. You can still be, you know, whatever, and go out and satisfy whatever deeper thing is driving you to seek out the services. So the, the, I think that the, the framing of that is really important in appealing yeah. to men's sensibilities. Yeah. So that conversation I think is a great example of that, of somebody who believes, believes themselves to be a person of integrity, believes themselves in some way to be heroic. I fought for this country. Shouldn't I, you know, and so reframing it in a way to help them see what they're participating in and how that's a violation of their own integrity, I think is, is really powerful and really and, helpful. And that's the, that's what the research has shown too, is that when, when, when men finally realized, I don't, you know, like it, there has to be some kind of epiphany, right? Where they go, I don't believe this is right. And I, and I don't want to do it anymore. Like, I think when they, if they can get to that point, uh, then, then things can change. And I think what, what we've figured out how to do is help men on that journey you know, kind of just walk with them for, it, it, it could be a 10 minute phone call, but it could be a, a life changing moment for them. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, um, they, but they have to come to that point where they realize this is, this is not right. It, it ought not to be this way, you know, um, but not, not every guy gets there. My most, I think the one that haunts me the most, and I, I actually had this conversation um, with a team, one of our teams. I was just observing, but I kind of jumped in and, and took a um, took a call or a text thread, and and I, you know, I looked at my phone, and it was a you know picture of a you know young kid naked standing in front of the bathroom mirror, and and it it literally it just said, um, I just turned eighteen, looking for a quickie. That was his response to the ad, and I and I. I, I texted him back. I said, dude, pull up your pants and let's talk. I'm not Michelle, you know, um, and, I, and I never heard from him again. So just but to I, clarify, he was the one sending the picture, yes. not you guys setting up some ad. No, yeah, okay. no, he, he was, yeah, sorry. Yeah. That's important clarification. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. In response to a fake ad, he sent that picture and, and a fake ad for you guys might look like what? So the fake ads are all with um, uh, blurred and cropped images that were um, that were procured um, from adult women who gave consent for the pictures to be used in the way that we we're using them. So I hate I don't really like the term ethically sourced, but we didn't just cut and paste images from elsewhere on the internet. And there's no nudity involved. In no, that. no, no. They're just uh, any any distinguishing you know tattoos or whatever would be blurred and faces are cropped. So, so he responds to that sending a nude of himself. Yep. Yep. And say, you know, basically that's his, his, his opener is that. And, um, I, what haunted me about it was I thought this kid just turned 18 when we talked about normalization, right? It's been so normal that on his 18th birthday, he knows that this is how the game is played. And I thought, what will he be like in 10 years or 15 years? Um, like, because the trajectory of that kind of behavior from what we've learned from survivors more often than not turns violent. And, and it just, and, and he, you know, he disappeared into the ether. I couldn't get him to talk. The frustrating part of this is the lack of agreement um, in the culture about how to address this. So you and I are having this conversation with a basic understanding of the harm that's invoked on the women and children's bodies who are used to service these men. Yeah. But there's a whole movement out there that exists to sanitize and project a narrative 
of these experiences as something positive. So the fight isn't just that this is going on, it's that this is going on and there's a large movement and to your point, a culture that's saying this is normal. This yeah. is this is tolerable. This is acceptable. This is um, in some ways to be celebrated. And so I think but only but only if they're over eighteen, right? Right. Same behavior, same person. You know, uh, a minute of difference, right between the last day of her 17th birthday and the first day of her 18th birthday. If she's past that arbitrary line, then it's fair game. But of course we don't wanna, you know, we don't wanna victimize and objectify the young women. So to be fair, I hope we can all agree, everyone across the board, that we don't want to see the exploitation of minors. Absolutely. So let's just, put that conversation aside for a moment. But a lot of these people, to your point, turn 18. Now they're adults. And that sets up a different conversation, which is what role does prostitution have in our culture? What access should men have to women's bodies for a price? And to that point, there's a large movement here in the US and around the world that is advocating for the full decriminalization of the prostitution experience. So the buying of the sex, the selling of the sex, um, the brothel keeping, all of that. And to, to fully embed it without any legal restraints in our communities. And, um, and so in those scenarios, what, what talk about your um, position related to that yeah because some of what you're sharing is is consistent with what i hear the pro sex work movement talk about which is that these men are just lonely these men are just needy these men are just seeking out connections so why not provide them with these quote unquote services yeah the um i understand the logic i don't agree with it, but i understand the logic of, of asking that question and framing it that way the problem is the the business structure that that grows up around that kind of unfettered demand um doesn't a couple problems it doesn't really delineate between the minor and the and the young adult um, and we've seen that anecdotally in the work we've done for the last 10 years of these guys. And we, we are not posting ads explicitly, um, you know, selling children, for example. But what we've we've encountered enough guys that um, want something slightly different. And those are the guys, to be clear, those are the guys, too, that we we will, you know, we'll pass that information on if need be to law enforcement for follow up. But um yeah, there's there's a there's a system that grows up around that unfettered um, market that um, that exploits the most vulnerable. I, I have to agree, just intellectually, I have to agree that there may be some women that would willingly choose that lifestyle. But what we've seen in research, what I what we've seen in in other places around the world where where it has been legalized or decriminalized is the demand exceeds the supply of willing people to meet that demand and it creates a vacuum and it creates an opportunity a market to exploit vulnerable people to fill that void um and we see it in we see it in germany um i think I, I was at meetings in dc last week and one of the um folks that i was in meetings with talked about in germany there's i think um you know it's been legal for 20 some years and the rationale was that if we legalize it, these women will register, you know, as protected sex workers and enjoy the benefits of, you know, kind of state protection and all of that. And after 20 years, I think they said there's eight women actually registered. And most of the women filling the brothels in places like Germany are undocumented immigrants from poverty stricken, famine stricken places that are lured into those markets under false pretenses. So you, you create a vacuum that's going to get filled by vulnerable people. And that's the problem with the legalization or decriminalization argument in, in my mind. And um, 
what we know from research about buyers is that there's a significant number of men who who have said if the circumstances were right they would become sex buyers as well and if we decriminalize it if we legalize it i'd, I'd call that the right kind of circumstances and so we, we would see I, I would predict an exponential jump in the number of men entering the market and then you just you know you multiply all that trauma all that violence all that risk um, yeah, in Germany, 80% of people in prostitution are from other countries. Mm -hmm. Same thing in Amsterdam. Yep. And Sabrina Valise talked about this uh, survivor from New Zealand where she... Where it's legal, yeah. Where it is also yeah. legal. So she was a part of the shift. She was in the sex industry prior to it becoming decriminalized, fully decriminalized, and was um, recruited and lured uh, into advocating with this movement for the passing of this legislation that would fully decriminalize it under the, the pretense, the, the, the promise of you'll have more independence, you'll be able to make more money, you'll be safer, there will be all these protections. So she went through that whole experience and then on the other side of it saw that the exact opposite was true. She had less rights, less privileges, made less money. And part of the reason for it was somebody would come to her brothel and say, well, I'm looking for such and such at such and such a price. The such and such was something she was not willing to do. The price was something she was not willing to accept. But the brothel owner goes, well, if you don't do it here, and if you don't do it for that much, they're going to go to the brothel down the street and get it. And so what they found is that they were having to compromise um, their own needs and boundaries to, you know, keep up with the, the demand. And, right. and, and, and then the very existence of a legal market of prostitution necessitates demand, markets demand. And so there's, it grows exponentially the, um, the, the demand side of this equation. But aside from all of that, and you know, we've talked extensively on, on our podcast about the shape and form of prostitution and trafficking and the whole experience of it. And there's a whole conversation to be had there. For the sake of this conversation, let's say for a moment that it was all above board, it was all safe, it was all the women were protected, it was all people doing it voluntarily which, you know, none of that is the case, but let's just say that it were. There's still a conversation that I think we need to have as men, which is, why are you buying yeah. another person? Yeah. <laughs> Even if they just, I, I don't entertain the notion that these people are there willing because otherwise why would they be charging? So the, in my view, the money is the thing that's coercing the sex, even in the best case scenario. Yeah, yeah. So the person clearly does not want you um, or they wouldn't be charging. Um, so, but just put that aside for a moment. Again, let's just say best case scenario um, is whatever this, you know, one off scenario that people refer to was the case. So even in that scenario, why are you as a man what, what about your manhood, your conception of masculinity, your conception of what it means to be a sexual person has taught you that that is acceptable or that that is okay? And um, so I'm curious to get your take on that of, yeah, like what's going on in these men's hearts that... Yeah. I don't know if I could presume to, to know exactly what's going on in their hearts, but as a man, um, what I, what I think maybe part of what's going on back to what I said earlier, we were raised in a culture that says men sit at the top of the power structure. And because it's, it's just this idea of sexual entitlement as a man, I am entitled 
uh, to sex. And, you know, even, you know, as, as teenagers were, and I've heard this, uh, I heard it in the church, I've heard it outside the church, but, you know, we're, we're um, you know, it's just the way boys are, right? They're, they're just driven. They're just all about sex. Like the culture has taught us that that's who we are at, at an identity level. And that gets baked into our, you know, our sense of masculinity. So um, it's, it's there even long before they ever you know, respond to an ad. So I think it's an identity thing. I think we are raised to think that this is who we are. And, um, and there are systems and markets and people willing to exploit that. And it's, in some ways, it is a kind of exploitation. They're not, the, the exploitation of the victim is, is exponentially greater and, and, and uh, more fraught with difficulty um, than, than the buyer. But in, in some ways, the system exploits the buyer's identity, his false sense of identity, and says, well, yeah, if you want to be a man, that's what you do. My wife is a high school teacher, and she has overheard her students, male students, talking when they, they're turning 18, and kids will go, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to go to the strip club. I'm going to go to the strip club and get laid. You know, it's like that kind of, um, these are 18-year-old boys uh, that have grown up thinking that this is their identity as men. So to your question, I think, and it's a much longer conversation, but um, we have this identity as men as being sexually entitled. And, it, and it's, it's also a marker for our masculinity, right? You know, we, we, we make heroes out of the guys that are having sex all the time. And, but if you look at the women that are having sex all the time, it's a completely different equation for them. Um, so um, I think it's I think there's a the culture has forged an identity in us as men that needs to be questioned, should be questioned and challenged. Yeah, because in my experience of talking with just what I would consider to be like normal guys, uh, if you getting on this subject, the immediate kind of argument is to shift blame. Yep. So it's not about so much about the guy seeking the size. Well, well, she's offering it. Yeah. Well, they she want to do it. this. Yeah. Well, they, so there's this, so that's why I'm trying to reframe this conversation. Forget that for a moment. And I hope there are guys out there either listening to this or watching this whose propensity is to do that. Forget about that for a second. Let's talk about your vision of manhood let's start there. I, I guess I, at some level understand that it, this is happening, what you're describing, but I also don't get it. You, you know what I mean? Like I get it at the level of, okay, there's a cultural phenomenon happening here, but I don't get it at the level of, I don't get how you as a man would construct a belief system that says that this is an acceptable way to satisfy your sexuality, to go out and purchase that from another. I think there's something so deeply intu intuitive in me that says, this is at some level, do, do, you, do you not feel that this is wrong? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like trying to put myself in that mindset of I'm gonna go pay another person you know, to, and then they'll say, well, you're paying, you know, other guys will retort back. Well, you're paying for it anyways. If you take them out on a date, and it's like, no, 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 no. That's <laughs> like, that's so the lines get blurred. And I, I don't know, I guess in, in having this conversation and sharing some of this, I think that my heart or my desire is, is really to steer this conversation towards developing healthy conceptions of masculinity and, and really in a very clear way, presenting what that is like giving men a vision yeah. for being a man of integrity um, that factors this conversation into it. Our volunteers, a lot of our volunteers, uh, track the same way as just what, what you described early on. And I heard a lot of them say this um, very naturally in talking to buyers kind of at the end of a conversation, they would say things like, dude, I know you're better than this. 
and it was a, is a really genuine statement and and if you heard the whole context of the conversation it, it totally made sense and so what they were doing is they were calling out uh, something better from inside those guys and pointing them in a positive direction it's the opposite of, of a sh- kind of a shame-based approach right where you're saying you're doing something wrong it's illegal you're gonna get busted you better watch out those things are all true that the risk is still there right but to have another man in in a very genuine way you know not necessarily look at a guy but in in conversation with a guy go hey I I know there's something better inside of you um, th- that's something our guys will say a lot to these buyers like that um, I think that's where we have to go. I think we have to um, we have to undo a lot of things that have been done in our culture. And I think and I think to be uh, to be completely transparent, like I, we've we've undervalued men. We've we've come to believe that that's all they're good for, you know, just in a kind of society at large. Let's you know, it's boys. Boys will be boys, right? That. Um, that abdication of responsibilities that boys will be boys or locker room talk, you know, as if that justifies it. It's like, it's always been that way. And I, and I think we, I think we fail, we fail our boys. Um, we fail our young men when we say, well, that's all you're good for. That's all you're likely to do. Um, and to me, that's, that's a failure. I think we're letting down, we're letting down boys. We're letting down men. I heard a um, Gail Dines. I don't know if you ever heard Gail. She's a researcher. Um, has done a lot of work in this area. And she said to me, "This is a problem in the hearts of men. And until we can address the heart, the best we can hope for is to get good at treating victims." And I'm like, "That's not good enough, you know." So it is a it is a heart problem. And I think, I think we can make progress if we start by calling that out of men, even in their, you know, even in their like worst moment, right? When they're trying to do something that is verifiably damaging and destructive. But even in that moment for us to go, there's something better in you. And I'm going to hold you to that. Um, that's, to me, that's a really hopeful message. I think we need more men who are leaders in the community upholding that standard of the highest way to be a man in the world and um, to to factor this conversation um, into that. That's who, like, are the volunteers that we've seen that have been a part of this for a long time. That's what I see. I, I, like, there's four things consistently I see in them that that are an expression of that. There, there's There's... Uh, obvious humility you know they know that they're not much different than these guys they're empathetic in the most genuine sense they have a kind of a inner strength like they're not gonna they, they don't back down they can be threatened you know these guys can say all kinds of horrible things but they'll stay right in there and they know that this problem is kind of like to have this insatiable hunger to see the world change for the better like the guys that we work with, not just in Epic, but but in other areas in this work, um, those are the guys that actually I think are are moving the needle and and addressing the deepest issues of this um, this problem, which is I think um, how we raise boys into men and and that sense of masculinity. Totally. Yeah. So I think the opportunity for you guys right now, what you're doing, meeting them at the point of sale present a different framework is so powerful and um my temptation getting into this work was how do i do everything and do it all at once and end (laughs) trafficking overnight you know so like i think i've should take about a week right yeah Yeah. it seems i've definitely like run myself ragged and i love the humility of we're going to do this one thing and we're going to trust that in doing this one thing, we're making a difference in the lives of the men who are feeling this. And and I know, you know, given the number of testimonies that come back to me, I know that you guys are doing that. So I just wanna thank you for your work. Thank you for coming to talk with me. Um, I'm really interested to continue this conversation with you and see, uh, you know, what more can we do to partner together in helping to create on-ramps for the rehabilitation of men um, over the long term, 
and um, you know both the guys that are at that point, but also just growing up in this culture. So um, definitely a big point of focus for us right now at Exodus Cry. And so I, I found this really insightful to talk with you. So thanks, Tom. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. You can check out all our podcast episodes, articles, and films at ExodusCry.com. And join the daily conversation by following Exodus Cry on all major social platforms.